for two hours because he couldn't go out of the house. The second thing is, he spoke to me in my language, Afrikaans, fluent. He took me into his office and for the next hour, we chatted. Poured me tea and we talked about Robben Island, talked about sport. He wanted to know about me, my upbringing. And I was too embarrassed to tell him how I was brought up, but he knew. And then after an hour, our time was up, I said thank you to him and I left. And people always ask me, so what did you feel? What did you think? And I initially thought, not a lot. And then when I got to my car, I said to them, the overriding feeling I had was, I felt safe. I felt I've just sat with a very wise man and I felt safe. I was in the presence of a great leader. So let's fast forward. The World Cup came to South Africa. We were not the favorites. I told you how badly we did in 92, but our trend was very good. We started winning a lot of games. The team was gelling. I was getting more comfortable as a captain. And the World Cup came to South Africa. We were playing Australia in the opening match. And Australia were the favorites to win the Rugby World Cup. They were undefeated in 12 months before the Rugby World Cup. So you can imagine, in the hearts of all of South Africa, they go, can they please win the World Cup? Like you will next year when your team goes to the World Cup. But in the minds, they say, it's too young, you know, they're inexperienced. We train incredibly hard and I won't bore you with those facts and I won't bore you with the attention to detail. We were finalizing our training session and you saw on the, on the, the trailer the helicopters that, uh, that flew to our training session. We heard that Mr. Mandela was coming to say hi to us. And I, um, when the helicopters landed, we just finished training, I walked up to him and I greeted him and the team all lined up uh, to greet Mr. Mandela. So I walked them over and I was going to introduce the first player to Mr. Mandela and his name is Kourbis. But before I could say, Mr. Mandela, this is, he said, ah, Kourbis, how are you? He's never met Kourbis. Then he went to Henny and to Andre. He knew the names of each and every player in that team and he's never met them. Incredible story. One of my friends was injured and he actually asked him about his injury and he gave him a springboard cap. And then the helicopters left. But there was magic in the air. There was a sense of purpose, the sense of, this is big. This is far bigger than what we've ever expected. The next day was incredible. When we ran out onto the field, I mean, my jersey moved by the sound of the people cheering us on. And we beat Australia. We actually beat them comfortably. South Africans were going, wow, maybe. I won't talk you through every game because I will take up too much of your time. I'm going to fast forward to the final. So we got to the final. On the other side, New Zealand were playing incredible rugby. They had it. This athlete, John Alomo, that was just incredible. What he did on, on the rugby field, I don't think will ever be repeated. Incredible player. So again, the South Africans were thinking, maybe, but in their minds, we play against the All Blacks. And there's two stories I want to tell you. The morning of the final, I got the team down into the hotel's foyer to go for a run. Normally what happens before a big match like that, imagine you doing your biggest deal. If you're a politician, you're making your biggest speech. If you're a, a sportsman, you're playing your, your biggest match. How nervous you are the night before. I could never sleep the night before a big game. So I brought them down to the foyer of the hotel just so that they can relax and we went for a run. But everybody was quiet. They were pale, very nervous. And as we were running, nobody said anything. But then I heard voices, children's voices. And I looked around my shoulder. And there were four kids, black kids, this big. 
They were selling newspapers on the street corners and they saw us and they started running after us and they started running next to us and they were shouting the names of these players that they would have never ever have known before, would have ever supported. Got back to the hotel and I'm not superstitious <laughs> and I started packing my bag and I put my jock strap Ladies, don't worry what a jock strap is. I put the jock strap that side. I put my boots on the other side and my gun guard. And then I started moving them all around. I was going nuts. And then I read this poem by Theodore Roosevelt, which our manager put under our door. It's incredibly powerful. It's not the critic who counts. It's not he who points out how the strong man stumbles or how the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and by sweat and by blood, who tries valiantly and errs again and again because there is no effort without error or shortcoming, who knows great devotion and spends himself at a worthy cause, and in the end knows the highest of ultimate achievement. But if he loses whilst daring greatly, knows that his place would not be with those cold and timid souls that knew neither victory nor defeat. We got to the stadium, there's many things that has happened, and I'm preparing for the match, very nervous, going through strategy, going through everything in my mind, and then there was a knock on the door, and the door opened. We didn't know Mr. Mandela was going to come to our changing room. And he walked into the changing room and he was wearing a springbok jumper, a springbok on his heart. When the ANC hated that symbol, didn't want the symbol, didn't want to support the springboks, he wore it on his heart. And he said to us, good luck. And as he turned around, my number six was on his back. I became so emotional. We ran out and I learned how to sing our anthem. I told you that I couldn't even speak Afrikaans properly. Our anthem is five languages. Afrikaans, English, Zulu, Koza, Sutu. I couldn't sing the anthem that day. I was so proud to be a South African because I knew if I opened my mouth, I would cry. I bit my lip so hard that the blood started running down my throat because I didn't want to cry. You should be tough when you're a rugby player. You can't cry in front of the world. It was an incredible match, very physical game. It went to the wire. And then when the final whistle blew, we were level with New Zealand. It's quite ironic. There were 65,000 people in the stadium. 99% of them were white South Africans. Most of them were Afrikaners. And when I didn't have words to say to my team, the stadium started singing a black man's song, Shosh Shaloza. It's a mine worker's song. And I just said to them, play for your country and you'll be okay today. We did. The final whistle blew and we became world champions. You could not imagine what happened in the streets of South Africa that night, in the villages across the country. For the first time in the history of our country, we were one. We became world champions. Now ladies and gentlemen, you are all living a story. One day it will be told by politician, it will be told by a journalist, it might be told by your husband, your wife, your partner, and if you're really lucky, Hollywood will tell your story. <laughs> so when John Carling, who wrote the book, Playing Enemy, he interviewed me four times after the World Cup, and I said to him, John, this story, Hollywood one day will make a movie about what happened in South Africa. He phoned me, he said, Francois, they're going to make a movie. I said, who's playing me? He said, Matt Damon. I said, yes. <laughs> he 
He's good looking, he's got hair, and he's very smart.